Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, somebody. Hallelujah. Amen. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Good morning, Second Baptist. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We preach you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are so excited to just be able to open up our eyes this morning so that we have breath in our bodies to give God praise. Just, if, even if it's just one more time, I'm going to give him my all this morning. Amen. Because he is worthy to be praised. As the choir opens up this morning, they're going to sing, I'm on my way to my destiny. How many of us believe that this morning? I know circumstances around us may seem a little grim, but I'm on my way to my destiny. Amen. So as they sing this song, I want us to reflect. And with a grateful heart, let's sing and praise our God this morning. Amen. Amen.
Hallelujah. We thank God. We thank God because we know that we are already victorious. I think the lights believe that. Or maybe did the rocks cry out for us this morning. But we are already victorious and God is good. Hallelujah. He's given us victory upon victory upon victory. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We have just a few quick announcements. Immediately following our morning worship at 11.30 a.m. to 12 p.m., join us for our war room prayer line. Amen. Amen. You can call 605-313-4166 and enter the pin 103330. This Wednesday, Bible study is canceled due to Turkey Day. Amen. So we just ask that you have safe travels, keep COVID safe, amen, or just, just spend this time being around your family or preparing the yummy dinner that you're going to make for Thursday, but we would like to wish each and every one of you a happy Thanksgiving, so Bible study, or excuse me, Word Alive Bible study will be canceled this Wednesday. On December 18th, our own Minister Khalees McGiveney will be getting ordained at 6 p.m. here at Southern Baptist Worship Center. Hallelujah, we look forward to that. And we also would like to give a very special thank you to all those who came, helped, and volunteered on Wednesday for our food box giveaway. We thank you. This church is striving to continue to be a blessing our community. Amen. 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 So we also would like to thank Sister Waynette who spearheaded this. Thank you so much. And we got rid of those boxes fast. <laughs> so that's a blessing. Also, um, yesterday, on yesterday, we had a Thanksgiving um, meal giveaway. We would like to thank the deacons who wanted to be a blessing to, in honor of our 120th church anniversary. So we were able to be a blessing to the community for that. So all those who volunteered, helped, donated, we thank you, thank you, and thank you. Amen. There are various ways that you can give. You can text SBGIVE to 28950. You can call our church at 610-384-2999. Or you can stop by at 857 Lumber Street here in Coatesville, Pennsylvania. And we will be here until noon. Amen. Amen. At this time, we will have our morning prayer by our own minister, Monica Tremel. She will come at this time. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Let us lift our voices and praise unto God, for he is God. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come before you today, Lord, we thank you for this day. No matter what we face, no matter what has come our way, Father God, we know that it is you and only you that gives us strength to endure another day. We praise you for who you are. We lift you up. We never forget your name, for that name is a name above all names. It can heal, it can strengthen, and it delivers. Father God, we pray for each and every individual that is suffering in sickness, Father God. For we know that you are in the midst of them. And no one in their families and their friends all around them shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in the land. For Father, we know that you will add numbers to their days. That's what your word says, Father God. Father God, we know that those who feel lonely and ostracized by just alone and closed up in these hard times and environments, Father God, we know that you are still in the midst amongst them all. Father God, we thank you and we adore you. We lift you up and we'll never forget who you are in our lives. We thank you for all of those who are around us. We pray for them, Father God, that you would lift them up. Father God, we thank you for each and every, every individual in this place today, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. forget all that he's done for us. Amen? The 
ways he's made, the doors he's opened. Amen. We will never forget the name of Jesus, for he is everything to us. Amen. How y'all feeling this morning? I know we're all sitting here with our masks, but I want you to holler this side, holler to this side, and this side, holler to this side. Say, it's good to see you. It's good to see you. It's good to be seen, right? Then I want us to do something else. I want us to stand to our feet, just really quick, do, you know, Humor me this morning. And I want us to shout in our loudest voice, hallelujah on the count of three. You ready? One, two, three. Hallelujah! 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 We don't want to rock and cry now for us this morning. Maybe not. We want to make it back and hear some music for God.
in this place. There's absolutely no other way. Bless you. Thank you, choir. No other way. Oh, bless his holy name today. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For another day to give you praise. Come on, put your hands together. Come on, put your hands together. Just your way of saying to God, we are grateful for your presence and your blessings. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. It is absolutely good to be here this morning in your presence and in the presence of Almighty God. For God has been good to us, each and every one of us. In spite of what you may think, God has been loving and kind, kind enough to keep us when we couldn't keep ourselves. Amen. Good morning, Second Baptist. Good morning. It is good to see each and every one of you this morning. I am grateful for your presence and pray that God has been kind and merciful towards you and has blessed your life immensely. This is another Lord's Day. This is a day that has been consecrated, dedicated, and made sacred specifically for us to give him praise and worship. And that's a good thing. Amen. Because you and I both know that we are not here because we've been good. Come on, don't look at me with that angelic face. You know as well as I do, there's been some things in your life that you know they caused you to stumble. Yeah, you, you, you've not lived that righteous. There's been some things that have gotten in your way. As a matter of fact, there were some days when you got in your way. Yeah, nobody else got in your way. You got in your way. But God was kind and loving and blessed us so that inevitably we would have an opportunity to give him praise and to worship him. You do recognize that God created us to worship him. You do know that. Yeah. He wanted and desired someone who would love him the way he loved them without being forced to, but someone who would be a free moral agent. You'd have an opportunity to pick and choose whether or not you wanted to give him praise. And so this morning, I arrived here in the context of worship because I wanted to praise him. Yeah. I, I wanted to praise him. Because everything that I've been through and everything that I've noticed in my life, God has brought me through it. God has blessed me with it. Everything that I have, everything that I possess, everything that is near me is near me because God has blessed me. Wasn't because I was good, wasn't because I was perfect, wasn't because I was educated, it was because God was loving and kind. And, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful. And you should be equally grateful. Amen. Amen. Bless God. This morning I greet you in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord, who indeed is our Savior. Well, the Hebrews suggested that God would send a Messiah, someone who would come, someone who would relieve the Israelites of their oppression, someone who would make sure that they could find their way back to Yahweh, the ultimate reality, the God who looms larger than any situation. Now that's a loving God, that even when humanity has blown it, has messed it up, God still says, let me make a way for them to get back to you. Whenever you read uh, the Hebrews Bible, the Tanakh, whenever you take a look at the Torah, when you look at the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, you discover that everything in there is designed in such a way so that we can get back to a good relationship with God. And I hope this morning that you came praying, expecting God to bless your heart. This morning, uh, before we begin, when we had our morning prayer, uh, before we began to serve, uh, we made sure that we gave a shout out to someone who is a part of this congregation who has been working to make sure that we uh, are able to get out to the airways, to make sure that we're on Facebook and YouTube so that our membership that cannot be here can at least view us. That person 
is Alex London. Alex, would you please stand with this woman? Give you a shout out this morning. But it's a special day for Alex because today is his birthday. And so we just want to wish you a happy birthday. And to let you know that we love you and appreciate everything you're doing in the life of Second Baptist. Amen, somebody. Bless you, sir. Bless you. Thank you, Alex. Great job. He has been committed uh, to doing what he has been doing uh, for a number of years now. And we, we're grateful. Thank you, man. I can't say thank you enough. Amen. Amen. My hat is also off this morning to those individuals who were kind enough to make sure throughout this week uh, that our community was taken care of. Amen. That just means that Second Baptist is not just here, it does not exist solely for the members of Second Baptist. That's right. Amen. It means that we continue to reach out into our community so that we recognize that our mission is to make sure that the lost are saved. Yes, sir, yes. If we ever forget that, if we ever negate that, we cease to be the ecclesia, the church that's called out from the world, and we just become another part of society that's a social club. Yes, so this Wednesday, my hat is off to individuals, Sister Wayne and the crew, those who made sure that boxes of food went out to our community. We say thank you for your endeavor and those of you who are committed to work. For those of you who are part of the deacon's ministries and those of you who are not a part of the deacon's ministry but made sure that things happened yesterday to give a hot meal to our community and the food was delicious. Uh, I was one of the first partakers. As a matter of fact, Lorraine uh, kind of chastised me this morning. So Tony, she said, uh, couldn't help but notice uh, that you and me were running around telling people how many plates you needed and how many needed to go out. And then number two, Dion was saying to me, uh, yeah, when I got here, the first thing I noticed was you were sitting down at the table. Uh, I confess, I was seated at the table and my food was hot and fresh. And so I, I thank you, all of you who made sure that we were able to bless our community. Sister Brenda, it is so good to see you this morning. Bless you, bless you. Sister Tony, I did receive that package. Bless your heart, thank you so much. And now I need to move, uh, to, to move strategically towards the scripture this morning. One other thing, because I, I try my best to make sure that I put all these points in my head uh, so that when I come before you, I don't forget someone because ultimately someone will be offended uh, when I do forget them. If I'm calling out names, I've got to be careful. Uh, this morning, I also just wanted to remind all of us that because of this pandemic, because we have challenges that we are facing, we had to minimize the numbers of individuals who are allowed in the sanctuary. And so you can't help but notice that when you arrive here on the door, it says that the maximum capacity in the sanctuary today is 40. So please don't be offended if you show up and you're number 41 or 42 and you can't get in. We are trying to live in compliance uh, with the state rules and the regulations. And my job is to make sure that one way or another, uh, we keep you safe. Amen. And so we require you to wear the mask and we re require you to remain seated at least six feet away from individuals who are not a part of your cluster or your family. Stand with me for a moment as I move strategically forward before the biblical text. And again, I want to say my hat is off to uh, video people, sound people, uh, all those individuals who make sure that we are able to do what we do. Are you happy to be here this morning? Yeah. 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 Second Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with verse 13 and reading through verse 18. Therein you'll find these words. 
according to the English Standard Version. The word says, since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believe, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For, this, for all your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us uh, for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. You may be seen in the house of the Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being in your presence. God, we acknowledge our sins and ask you in the name of Christ Jesus to forgive us. We are weak and in desperate need of your strength. So would you strengthen and encourage each of us that again we might look more like you every day. We pray that your Holy Spirit, our teacher, will continue to reveal to us those truths that are hidden therein and cause us this day to live in such a way that we please you. Be with us now. We ask it in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord. Tammy, is that you out there this morning? Bless you. Good to see you, my sister. Bless you. Welcome home. Is it okay if I talk to you this morning from this simple thought? An attitude of gratitude. Come on, sir. An attitude of gratitude. And you think, just for a moment, we are moving this week towards a time when so many of us are celebrating a time of thanksgiving. A time of thanksgiving. Historically, we, we usually think about the, the pilgrims, uh, those individuals who dressed strangely back in the day. Uh, we forget that sometimes there is a misnomer for how they arrived at the geographical location that they arrived at. We forget that the Europeans somehow made their way towards the Americas and, and stopped off at some islands where they were busy seeking, supposedly, a land where they could establish religious freedom. We forget that somehow, even in light of religious freedom, they had a tendency but to enslave individuals along the way and to also at the same time uh, take properties and uh, substance that really didn't belong to them. Uh, that made their way towards North America and they were looking for a specific location but got lost even then. Coming from England in a town called Plymouth that made their way up the sea, eastern seaboard and somehow landed at the place in Massachusetts that they named Plymouth. You do remember that Malcolm said, said that indeed uh, we didn't land at Plymouth, but actually it landed on us. I'm talking about an attitude of gratitude. I, I didn't arrive here this morning to give you some uh, history lesson, but I wanted to remind us that there should be a pivotal reason in our lives for desiring or to have an attitude that suggests that we're grateful for what God has done. So you're asking yourself, what does all this have to do with the biblical text this morning? And so I just want to remind us that there are some historical feats in the text 
that somehow forces the hearers or the audience in this biblical text to recognize that they had some reason to be grateful for what has transpired. Sometimes we can become so accustomed to a thing, we can uh, get so used to it that we forget that there are some things that we should be grateful for. I, I know you, you've been where you are, that station in your life, where you've been there so long that you've forgotten that you didn't arrive at that station uh, because you were that wise. Hmm. You, you've forgotten that somehow uh, somebody laid some foundation for you so that you could do what you do and have what you have. Hmm. You do recognize that we were not always allowed uh, to ride at the front of the bus. Yeah. We were not always allowed the opportunity to live in the communities in which we live. Some individuals uh, went before us and experienced some things that we didn't have to experience because they laid frameworks and and, and lay the foundation so that somehow we could live where we live, work where we work, drive what we drive, and possess what we possess. But I know you're looking at me and thinking to yourself, uh, you weren't raised from that side of the track where you didn't have to eat certain types of sandwiches. Anybody in the house ever remember having to eat uh, mayonnaise sandwiches? I, I told you, I got this aristocratic uh, church membership today. They, they, they don't know what it's like but to have to eat the government peanut butter. I, I didn't want it to go to the government cheese. which made the best macaroni and cheese, by the way, and the grilled cheese sandwiches. There was a time when we didn't have a whole lot. I, I'm talking about helping us to recognize that today we have a reason to be grateful. Yeah. So let me pull back for just a moment because when I'm lecturing, before the students at the school, uh, I'm usually suggesting that there are some criteria that have to be met before you can deal with the subject matter at hand. And so let me pull back for just a moment so that somehow I can help us understand that biblically there are some historical pieces in the text that will help us to understand why we perceive that Paul should be grateful. You do recognize that historically Paul was an individual who formerly was known as Saul, Whenever there is established relationship with the God that we serve, uh, who we once were, we are no longer. He was Saul. He was an individual who was perceived as someone who was persecuting those who were indeed the followers of the way. They were individuals who said that they believed in the coming of the Messiah. They just had a problem accepting the one that's here in the first century. They believed that someone who was going to come was going to relieve them of their oppression and somehow help them to live out their lives in a better way. But it could not have been this one. Because after all, his uh, vitae was not correct. His port portfolio was questionable. His family obviously was fickle because mama and brother suggested that he himself was beside himself. Another phrase that's used that suggests that obviously mentally he was incapable of doing what he was doing. I'm still talking about an attitude of gratitude, but I've got to give you the foundation for the text. Because if you don't know why Paul is writing, to this group of individuals the way he's writing, you'll never fully understand how Paul can arrive at this station in his life. Some of you are sitting here this morning 
and you are really rolling around in your head some of the things that have transpired in your personal life and you know where you once were. You know some of the things that transpired in your life and how you had to wrestle with them. And today God has blessed you to be where you are. But somehow you've neglected to give thanks. Paul addresses an issue. He recognizes that just a few years back he was serving the Christ. After all, he was locked down on the Damascus Road so that somehow the scales would be lifted from his eyes so that he could see for the Christ, for who he really was. And some of us obviously are still blinded by some of our past and we really can't see who God really is. We've forgotten how messed up we really were, what life used to be like, but somewhere along the way you have your own personal Damascus road experience so that God opens up your eyes so that you can see him for who he really is. But it doesn't happen like this text. It doesn't appear to happen like the New Testament where literally you hear a voice, you see a light greater than any light. What if it is a symbolism? What if if it is a metaphor to suggest to you that there are some things that will happen in your life that will open up your eyes so that you can see. So that you're not down to recognize you're not quite as big as you think you are. So that when you can see, when you are knocked down, you can also hear it so that it becomes plain that he's specifically speaking to you. And Paul goes through all of this and all these things are transpiring in his personal life. And somewhere along the way, when he's attempting to help others, he recognizes that there is far more to the Christ than they initially anticipated. Yeah. Verses 13 to 18. That suggested that the previous passage of Scripture that dealt with the fact that all of us are just made of clay. All of us are just vessels that will convey a truth that is so valuable and important to humanity that somewhere along the way it should cause a transition in the lives of others, an attitude of gratitude. The one thing that he wants to express in this second of Corinthians, which is the third letter, he is saying to them that the one thing that I need you to understand in life is that the one that you were looking for has been here. He has arrived. Indeed, not only has he arrived, he has suffered on behalf of all of humanity. And sometimes we forget that this is not just a pigmentation of our imagination. This is not something that we just read about as a piece of history. These are lives of individuals who were real, who came, who blessed us, and somehow left words of wisdom so that our lives might be made better. And so we show up in the context of our comfortable houses of worship. And we kick back and we relax because we're comfortable. We feel safe. And there's no Roman soldiers outside running around trying to stop us from seeking the God who created and sustains us. And so we arrive in here and we are just comfortable. As long as the heat is at the right temperature, as long as it's just cool enough, as long as the light is at the right level and we can sit back in our comfortable chairs, we are happy and forget that we ought to have an attitude of gratitude. And so Paul reminds them, now don't forget that the Christ came, but he also died. We sometimes get past the peace that there was much suffering of the Christ who came so that we might live. And so then Paul reminds his hearers that the Christ who came and the Christ who suffered, suffered on our behalf. He suffered so that somehow the relationship that we ought to have with God, we can have with God the very moment that we embrace him and accept him and recognize that just as he suffered, we too 
must suffer. Now, I, I got to be honest with you. I don't like suffering. I don't like pain. I like for everything just to go smooth, a smooth sailing. Everything should be just right. I said that I had to help you to understand the historical piece behind it. But whenever looking at the biblical text, you also have to recognize that there is a belief system that's there. And so when we're looking at the historical piece and when we're looking at the belief system, we got to recognize that these first century Christians, individuals who are making their way to follow Christ, have a belief that they're trying to establish so that somehow individuals who will follow in the future will recognize there's some stability in following the truth. Amen. You know, we don't really like to be taught what's truth. We just like to feel like it's okay if I'm comfortable, if I show up and, and somebody preaches me happy and if we can wave our hands and shout, just don't teach me. <laughs> we have a difficult time with the teaching piece. And yet in the first century, these fathers of the church were involved in what we call the didache, which is literally the teaching found in the scriptures so that somehow we can better understand the foundation for what we believe. Why do you believe what you believe? Is it because somebody else said it? Is it because it's tradition? Do, do we worship on Sunday just because it's tradition or because it's biblically correct? Do we partake of the Lord's Supper on the first Sunday of the month because that is what the Bible says or is it because that's what our tradition says? Come on, I'm, I'm talking about the belief that's found in the text because the belief wants us to, to know without a doubt that there are some things that are concrete and evident that we should follow because it is biblically correct. And students that ask often, why in the world or should we accept and embrace what we accept and embrace? Why are you Christian? I mean, they will ask me that. Since you know about Hinduism and Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, other religious faiths, why are you Christian? My adherence to, to being a Christian is because I believe that the Protestant denomination that I'm a part of follows and adheres to the canon that we have. The scriptures that we have before us are scriptures that will lead us to the Christ that we've been taught about. It's not just enough, good enough just to show up on Sunday and say that I'm going to embrace this just because somebody else said it. Examine it for yourself. History, belief, practice. It's one thing to know the history any particular thing. Those of you who study literature, you recognize that the literature may be extremely profound. You may discover something about the individual who's written or who has wrote those particular pieces of literature. But what gives them the right? Every time we are assigned a book to read, every one of us should at least take the opportunity to discover why this person wrote what they wrote. I, I know this doesn't sit well with you this morning because you feel like you just went to school. <laughs> what gives someone the right to, to write what they write? If Paul is writing this letter to the church at Corinth, what was he attempting to do? Was he attempting to impress people in some way? Was he trying to inform them? I suggest to all of us this morning that the individual was trying to inform his audience indeed of the information that he had ascertained so that somehow it may make their lives better. And so he points out the issues that he's facing, facing the issue of some individuals who have aligned, maligned his character, who's decided that somehow they're going to infiltrate the church and stop its progress. There are individuals in the 21st century who are still attempting to malign the characters of leadership in the church and trying to stop the progress of the church. 
I'm not talking about Second Baptists, I'm talking about the Universal Church. There are individuals who really can't perceive that the church has any relevance in the 21st century. And so Paul is pointing out in the first century that there are some things that the church indeed stands for. It stands for the fact that without a doubt the church wants the world to know that the Christ who came is the individual that God designated to come. He designated his son to come, but his son came, suffered, bled, and died. Now that's not the end of the story because Paul wants us to know that even though he came, he bled, he died, God knew that he was going to suffer, knew that he was going to die, and therefore designed a way for him to be resurrected from the dead. Now this, for many, became problematic. It became difficult because they couldn't perceive of anybody being raised from the dead. And Paul says not only was he raised from the dead, but the good news is that when we indeed have suffered through this life, when we've gone through some things, we as well as Christ will be raised from the dead. This fourth chapter is all about the victorious living of individuals who will have to endure some of the manure in life, have to put up with some of the stuff, and at the same time be resurrected to be in the presence of God throughout eternity. And so he says the more and more people who believe and embrace this, will begin to thank God, thank God even more. You do understand that as you approach Thanksgiving, this biblical text is talking about the people who have been blessed by God, recognize they are blessed by God. And so as a result of being blessed by God, they begin to give thanks more and more to God. So if God hasn't done anything for you lately, you might be quiet and reserved in giving God thanks. But if in fact God has raised you from a miserable predicament in your life, if somehow God has blessed you to have some peace in the midst of your turmoil, if during a pandemic you you recognize that people around you have become sick and some have died. You do recognize that God has put a protective mechanism around you. So all of a sudden, you get an attitude of gratitude. You are not here this morning because you were that good, but because God has blessed you. And so today you show up in the context of worship just to give God some things. Now, I can't speak for you, but when I sit down at the table on any day, not just Thanksgiving, not just that particular day, but I want to give God thanks because God has protected me. God has provided for me. God has kept me. And so I'm just going to keep on having my attitude of gratitude. So when you see me and I might be going through something, you don't know that I'm going through it, but I'm just going to give God praise for all that God has done. And so this week, when you are sitting down with your family, you recognize that you're sitting there because God has been with you, because he's protected you, because he's kept you, because he has blessed your life in such an awesome way. So whatever you do, this week, have an attitude of gratitude. I, I like it when Paul winds it up in that 18th verse by suggesting to us that what God has done is that not only has he raised and resurrected the Christ, but he's also given us an opportunity to live out our lives so that when it's all said and done, our lives might be resurrected as well. And not just for this transient moment, but God says, I'm going to bless you throughout eternity. And that goes for all and all. I mean, you can't even stop eternity. You can't even say that it's forever. It's longer than forever. And so this morning, I suggest to you, in light of what you know about me, in light of what you know about God, you go ahead and give God thanks.
those of you that God has done a great deal for, you got a whole lot to be grateful for. Just like the woman that had the seven demons cast out of her, and they couldn't understand why Jesus didn't reprimand her. Uh, he didn't reprimand her because he knew that he had done some great things in her life. Bless you today. Come on, stand with me for just a moment. Choir, come on. You got to have an attitude of gratitude. Bless God. Bless God. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. God, we thank you that you continue to bless us in spite of us. Thank you for loving us even when we were too unloving to love ourselves. Thank you, God, for keeping us when we knew we couldn't keep ourselves. Thank you, God, for watching over us, for protecting us, for providing for us. Yes. Thank you, God. We just can't thank you enough. If we had 10,000 tons, we still can thank you enough. Thank you, God, for waking us up this morning. Thank you, God, for blessing us throughout this day. Thank you for our worship service, God, that we can show up and give you praise. Thank you, God, for saving our wretched souls. Thank you, God. We just want to thank you, God. That's all. Bless his holy name. If in fact you are blessed by the Lord and God has touched your life, has touched you, you're not a part of a church, find you a good solid church that you can go to that is teaching, that is preaching, one that will love you and one that will look out for your well-being. If in fact you are here this day and the Lord has spoken to you, now is a good time for you to give your life to Christ Jesus. Bless us, choir. Bless us in the 